uh, hello. I would like to um, thank you, Professor Pess and Professor Taylor, uh, for inviting me to participate in the Maimonides Seminar, part of the framework of philosophy in the Abrahamic traditions. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to say that I'm somewhat unused to this format, and as a result, um, even though I have a PowerPoint and I appear in a small window on your screen, I certainly hope, uh, there are, there's material in my lecture which is actually not in the uh, PowerPoint. So uh, if you have to choose between the, one or the other, you better do well to listen to me, and occasionally there will be summarized points and then passages instead of a handout uh, for, on the PowerPoint. In any event, once again, I'd like to thank you for the invitation, for the opportunity to revisit a difficult and scholarly contentious issue in Maimonides. Uh, the plan of my talk is as follows. I will open with a few preliminary remarks on divine will in the Guide of the Perplexed, and then I will consider particularly the distinction between eternal will, uh, Mashiach Kaldima, and novel will, Mashiach Haditha as well as the evidence that Maimonides accepts the notion of novel will with respect to God. Now, what I mean by novel will is that God may will one thing at a time and not that thing, but not that thing, but something else at another time. I will argue that on the question of divine will, Maimonides tries to navigate between the skill of the Mutakalamun and the Charybdis of the Aristotelians but that he lacks the proper navigational tools to do so. In other words, he lacks an explanatory uh, apparatus, philosophical um, framework. What he's left with are conflicting commitments that he feels to be at least at present irreconcilable. Uh, I will conclude that Maimonides' rejection of the claim that God eternally the wills the world into being, which he associates with one of the Latter-day philosophers, is genuine and thoroughgoing and consistent with his claim that Torah teaches that God has novel will, a claim which actually appears in a work posterior to the Guide of the Perplex, indeed, his last work, as we will see. But first, a, preliminary, a few preliminary remarks about divine will. Um, divine will for Maimonides is not an attribute because Maimonides denies that God possesses any attributes in the sense of there being properties superadded to his essence. Maimonides treats will and other attributive terms as what I would call nominal attributes or abbreviated descriptions of God, uh, mostly as he relates to the world. These nominal attributes are formulated according to what we apprehend of the world. So in the chapter on negative attributes, Maimonides arrives at the notion of divine will in the following manner. He writes, we apprehend that the existence of this being, that is God, which is, is its essence, suffices not only for his being existent, but also for many other existence following from it. And that this emanation, unlike that of heat from fire, and the proceeding of light from the sun is an emanation that constantly procures for those existences duration and order by means of wisely contrived governance. Accordingly, we say of him, because of these notions, that he is powerful, knowing, and willing. The intention in ascribing these attributes is to signify that he is not powerless, nor ignorant, nor negligent. And the meaning of our saying that he is not inattentive or negligent is to signify that all the existing things in question proceed from their causes according to a certain order and governance, not in a neglected way, so as to be generated as chance would have it, but rather as all the things are generated that a willing being governs by means of purpose and will. Uh, so, will can be viewed as a nominal attribute, sort of shorthand for the notion that God brings existing things into being and governs them through purpose. Now, that the world is the product of divine purpose is taught by Scripture, according to Maimonides, 
and can be shown by means of proofs approximating demonstration. And this is precisely what he does in the chapters uh, or, or concerning creation. Maimonides also believes that the goal-orientedness of natural things is a strong argument for divine purpose. While he recognizes that this is not conceded by the philosophers, he claims that they are forced to posit a divine or intellectual principle to account for this goal-orientedness. It's true that they do not view the world as the product of a purposeful voluntary deity, but rather as proceeding of necessity from this divine intellectual principle or cause. Now, Maimonides rejects the Aristotelian notion or view that the first cause is not a voluntary agent. But he also rejects the view of some or one of the Latter-day philosophers, which, which scholars often identify with Avicenna, that God eternally wills or purposes the world into existence. In a well-known passage, Maimonides writes, But this is not the meaning of purpose as we propose to conceive it. For we wish to signify by the term that the world does not necessarily proceed from its causes without being able to be separated from it, or to change unless its cause or one of its modes also change. We affirm that all these things have been made by him in virtue of a purpose and a will directed toward this particular being which did not exist and now became in existent in virtue of his will. Will and purpose are not compatible with necessity, according to Maimonides. A voluntary agent requires the ability to will or not to will, to choose or particularize a particular thing among other possibilities, from among other possibilities. Now, Maimonides allows that having chosen to create the world at a certain instant, God can perpetually will the world to exist, in which case the world is eternal a parte post. But he insists that God, may be he be exalted, has the power to change the whole of the world or to annihilate it or to annihilate any nature in it that he wills. To suggest otherwise is problematic for two reasons. First, it implies that God is unable to change nature, that he lacks, for example, the ability to, quote, lengthen a fly's wing or shorten a worm's foot, end quote, which constitutes for Maimonides a disgraceful notion concerning the deity and hence a reason to reject it. By the way, I mentioned when he says that this is a disgraceful notion concerning the deity, the inability to lengthen a fly's wing or shorten a worm's foot, he's using the same philosophical justification for rejecting um, the notion of uh, eternity, or, or actually not the same, but the, a similar um, consideration that the Aristotelians did when they claimed that the notion that God acts at a certain time and then begins to act or acts, doesn't act at some time and then acts at another time when the world is created constitutes a disgraceful notion concerning the de deity. In any event, there's another reason. Maimonides, and I think this is actually a very critical one, Maimonides says that an eternal world or a world that proceeds eternally from God implies that scriptural reports of miracles must be explained figuratively, that there cannot be Miracles the way he understands it, which is temporary suspensions of the natures of things. And the figurative interpretation of at least some miracles is rejected as based on fantasies, what he calls hadayan. If the world is the product of divine will and purpose, then just as God particularized the world to exist at a certain time in the way that it exists, God can, should he so wish, alter the nature of things or even abolish them entirely. Now this robust view of divine will is tempered by Maimonides' view that what God wills is determined by God's wisdom and that God can be justifiably described as intellect, which is of course an Aristotelian notion. 
Still, a will determined by wisdom for Maimonides is considered will if and only if it has the ability to will otherwise. And in God's case, the historical fact of well-attested miracles shows not only that God has the power to suspend the nature of things, but that he has historically, in fact, done so. So this moderately robust notion of will also emerges from Maimonides' response to one of the philosophical arguments for the eternity of the world. The argument goes as follows. A voluntary agent acts at one time and not at another based on the impediments or incentives that hinder or motivate her actions. But God is not motivated or hindered by such incentives, incentives or impediments. Hence, there is no cause for an alteration of will. That is to say, for him to act at one time and not at another, based on impediments or incentives that hinder or motivate actions. On the contrary, God's action, this is still the philosophical argument, God's action exists continually in actu, from which follows that the world is eternal. Now, Maimonides' response is that this is indeed true of corporeal agents who possess will, since their will is determined by things external to them, for the sake of which they act. But incorporeal agents need not act always in the same manner, since their action is consequent solely upon their will, by which he means that they do not act for the sake of anything else. Certainly no external impediment or incentive. This allows him to claim that not only does God's action not change when he acts after having not acted, his will does not change when he wills after not having willed. Quote, for the true reality of will means to will and not to will. Now, the context here is God's willing to bring the world into existence after willing it not into existence or and not willing it into existence. And of course, since Maimonides holds that God created time with the world, the notion of after here should not be taken temporally. And, and this point was already made by Ghazali in the incoherence. But Maimonides also applies his principle to putative changes of will that occur within time, such as the staff of Moses turning into a snake, which involves a temporary change or suspension of the nature of the wooden staff. So here I have, let's see, these temporary changes in the natures of things, oh, sorry, there we are. Get back here. They do not constitute for Maimonides a change in God's will. Now, he does not hold that there is no change in God's will because God eternally willed that the staff would not be a snake at T sub 1 and then it would become a snake at T sub 2. Rather, Maimonides holds that a change that is internally motivated, not brought about through an external motive or impediment, does not constitute a change at all. This property of will is found not only in God, but in all incorporeal agencies, agents, such as the separate intelligences. Of them, Maimonides says that they act through will and choice, although their choice is different from our choice, since they deal with external things, and since they have been determined by God to always choose the good. In other words, although willing at X at T sub 1 and not X at T sub 2 does not constitute a change in will for the separate intellects, they have been created such that, in effect, their actions and choices are uniform. Or as Maimonides would say, God's will decreed, or his wisdom required, that the separate intellects choose and will only the good. Now, the statements and passages I have looked at so far portray Maimonides at his most voluntarist, albeit, as I noted, 
a voluntarism that is tempered by his claim that God's will is consequent upon his wisdom. This model differs from the divine voluntarism that my voluntarism that Maimonides rejects in Guide 325. There he refers to a sect among the people of speculation who claim that God acts to no end and purpose, but out of will alone. Quote, God does what he wills, not consequent upon wisdom. End quote. This is tantamount to saying for him that God's actions are pointless, in fact, intentionally pointless, since according to this view, God deliberately and knowingly acts without an end. The sect was led to this view because they correctly hold that God created the world from will alone. They assert of necessity what everyone asserts who maintains that the world was created in time. God willed it so, there being no other cause. End quote. Their mistake, however, was to infer that because there was no reason for the world as a whole, there was no reason for any of its parts. Now, although this appears to imply that Maimonides agrees with these scholars that the world was created out of brute, inexplicable will alone, he states explicitly here that none of our scholars and none of our men of science believe that creation came about through the will and nothing else. He continues, For they, our sages and scholars, say that his wisdom may he be exalted, the apprehension of which is beyond us, affirmed of necessity the existence of the world as a whole when it came into existence, and that the self-same immutable wisdom affirmed non-existence before the world came into existence. Now, some readers have suggested that the thrust of Guide 325 goes against Maimonides' divine voluntarism in the creation chapters, especially in 225. In chapter 225, his emphasis is on, is on divine will, and in chapter 325, it is on divine wisdom. But I, the way I read Maimonides, basically says that his doctrine of divine will is consistent throughout the guide, but that different contexts call for different emphases. In the creation chapters, Maimonides' opponents are the Aristotelians who deny God's will or interpret it such as to drain it of its meaning. In the chapters on theodicy and the purposefulness of the world in part three of the guide, Maimonides' opponents are those who consider it to be an impiety to impute purpose and rationality to God's world and to his law. Maimonides, consistently throughout the guide, never himself adopts the position of will alone to the exclusion of wisdom. As he puts it, the idea that any of God's actions is vain, futile, or frivolous is incapable of being, being expressed by any intelligent purpose. None of God's actions are arbitrary since they express purpose. Even the production of the world at a certain instant, which is attributed to Guide 225 and throughout the book to divine will, is attributed in Guide 325 to an incomprehensible divine wisdom that necessitates the existence of the world as a whole at the moment which it comes into existence and its non-existence before it came into existence. Maimonides replaces God's acting from will alone without a cause with God's acting from a wisdom that is often incomprehensible and by so doing avoids the problem of God's acting for no purpose. Now, in fairness to the contradiction hunters, Maimonides is not consistent in his use of the phrase will alone. It depends on context. Thus, in Guide 123, God's acts are said to be accomplished by means of will alone. In that chapter, will alone means without an instrument, a position that is accepted both by adherents of the law and the philosophers. In Guide 218, God acts are also said to be accomplished by means of his will alone, but there, the phrase means not for the sake of an external end, a position that is accepted at least by adherence to the law, but also perhaps by the Latter-day philosophers mentioned in Guide 221. 
In guide 313, my mind considers the final end for all that all that exists to be God's will alone, for which no other final end can be sought. This view is said by him to be similar to the view of the philosophers that there is no ultimate end for all that exists besides the permanence of its, its existence. And in Guide 317, the claim that events befalling humans are consequent upon will alone is associated with the Asherites and not with the adherents of the Law of Moses or the Mutazilites or the philosophers. So the moral of all this is that the will alone position varies according to the context of this discussion, and doubtlessly according to Maimonides' dialectical purposes. But as I just said, he is always committed to divine will being directed by divine wisdom. And I'd like to say a few words about this, um, the relationship between divine will and wisdom. What does it mean, according to Maimonides, for divine will to be directed or determined by divine wisdom? We recall that according to him, God deliberately brings existing things into being and governs them by means of purpose. So will implies intentionality and purpose. Although God never acts for the sake of something external to himself, because that would make that which is inferior the goal of that which is superior, his actions for his own sake creates a world that has purpose and which is goal-oriented. The blueprint for the world including its being created after its non-existence, is part of God's wisdom. Now, some readers have argued that because Maimonides denies the reality of attributes and identifies divine will and wisdom, in effect, he reduces divine will to wisdom. And if he identifies wisdom with intellect and knowledge, that his moderate voluntarism is tantamount to that of the Latter-day philosophers, who hold that God wills the world eternally into existence, despite his disclaimers. Now, in other words, despite Maimonides' disclaimers. Now, since Maimonides explicitly says that God's will is eternal and unchanging, this is part of this argument, it follows because of Leibniz's law that divine will is eternal and unchanging. And this would seem to rule out God changing nature or abolishing nature, which of course contradicts what we said above. This is what I would call the reductionist strategy, um, particularly of those people who want to say that Maimonides is uh, sort of secretly Aristotelian, thoroughgoing Aristotelian. But does Maimonides claim actually that divine will and divine wisdom are identical? The evidence generally presented for such a claim is twofold. First, as I've just mentioned, Maimonides appeals to divine will and wisdom as alternative explanations, both of which he appears to accept. Second, and more to the point, Maimonides says that divine will and divine wisdom are identical with God's essence, from which one may wish to infer that they are identical with each other. Indeed, since Maimonides does not believe in the reality of attributes, doesn't the identity of will and wisdom follow from the self-identity of the divine essence? Or, I would say, from the identity of will with the divine essence and wisdom with the divine essence, it follows that will and wisdom are identical. In Guide 218, Maimonides writes, quote, For in our opinion, volition too is consequent upon wisdom, all these being one and the same thing. I mean, his essence and his wisdom for we do not believe in attributes. Now, although Maimonides takes the reference of these to be God's essence and his wisdom, couldn't the same be said of God's wisdom and his will, that they are one and the same thing, especially for one who denies the reality of attributes? And the answer is yes, of course it could. In, insofar as wisdom and will are identical with the divine essence, it does follow that in a sense they are identical with each other. But it also follows that wisdom is identical with power, power with life, life with knowledge, and so forth. But while this makes such attributes ontologically one and the same thing, they are distinct with respect to our understanding. Thus, we can talk about God's will without talking about his life, 
Or we can posit relations between attributes, even though those relations are obviously from our perspective only. To use a phrase from contemporary philosophy of language, talk about divine attributes for Maimonides is referentially opaque. Certain predicates can be truly affirmed of certain divine attributes and not of others, because the truth of those predications depends upon the different contexts of those attributes. Even the attributes of life and knowledge, which Maimonides argues in Guide 153, quote, form in this case one notion, end quote, will have different predicates affirmed to them, of them. It is true of God's knowledge, for example, that it encompasses the infinite, according to Maimonides, but is not true of God's life, that it encompasses the infinite. Maimonides simply wishes to say here that God lives and knows by virtue of the same notion, which is not the case with other knowers and living things. In fact, as has been pointed out by the uh, Israeli scholar Eliezer Goldman, if we look at my, what Maimonides actually says about the relation between will and wisdom, we see that he implies a fundamental asymmetry between the two that rules out conceptual identity. In several places, God's will is said to be consequent upon divine wisdom, but nowhere is God's wisdom said to be consequent upon his will. Will is consequent upon wisdom, not because they are ontologically one and the same thing, but because God's will is directed by his wisdom, or better, God's will is not arbitrary or without a purpose. This not only shows asymmetry, but also that of the two attributes, wisdom has pride of place as that which directs divine will, which in turn executes the requirements of wisdom. When Maimonides answers certain imponderable questions about the heavens in Guide 225 with, God willed it so, or his wisdom necessitated it to be so, he is not basing his parallel answers, God willed it so, or his wisdom necessitated it to be so, on the ontological identity of, two, of the two, nominal attributes, but rather on his view that will is consequent upon wisdom. Or to put this another way, the ontological identity explains to us nothing about the conceptual relationship between the two. Maimonides never appeals to the fact that divine wisdom and divine will are ontologically identical to explain anything about the other. One might think that the notion of intentionality already presupposes wisdom or intelligent design. Yet, as I mentioned above, Maimonides report, reports the views of a sect that holds that God intentionally and knowingly acts without any end or utility. So while formulations like God willed it to be thus and his wisdom determined it to be thus are alternative descriptions of the same phenomenon, they don't mean the same thing. God's wisdom determined that the world be created after not existing. But that wisdom, which is eternal, did not entail that the world is eternal. Maimonides says explicitly the same wisdom determines non-existence and afterwards existence without being a change in the wisdom when the world begins to exist. The point that wisdom and will are not conceptually identical in God, nor can one tell us something about the other, can also be seen by how Maimonides responds to the philosophical objection that if the world were created, that would entail a change in God's wisdom. We recall that Maimonides had responded to the objection that if the world were created, that would entail a change in God's will. Presumably now, if will and wisdom are synonymous, then the structure of Maimonides' response to these objections should be the same. In fact, they are not. The resolution of the objection to creation based on God's will changing is considered by him to be, quote, difficult and subtle, end quote. Whereas the very objection to creation based on God's wisdom changing is considered by him to be feeble and easily answered. As we heard earlier, God can will one thing at T sub 1 and not will not that thing at T sub 2 without there being a change of will, since will means to will and not to will. In the case of the latter, divine wisdom can determine divine will to create the world together with time as part of its eternal immutable plan. Does this require divine will to be eternal, according to Maimonides? Although, as we shall presently see, Maimonides does speak of God's eternal will, there is reason to interpret him as holding that God's will, though unchanging, 
can be novel or originated if wisdom requires. That is to say, just as wisdom requires the world to exist after not existing, it may require the natures of things to be temporarily suspended or even suspended altogether. And in this case, God's immutable wisdom will direct God to will something different, what he calls novel will. Elsewhere, I've suggested that Maimonides' view evolved from the non-recognition of novel will to, excuse me, to acceptance of it in his later writings. In his early commentary in the Mishnah, Maimonides considers the view of the rabbis to be, with respect to miracles, that God implanted natures within existing things during the six days of creations, and that God embedded even miracles within the natures of things as infrequent natural occurrences. And he contrasts that with the view he attributes to the Mutakalimun, that God successively wills things to exist, all things to exist, at successive moments. Maimonides is consistent in rejecting the Kalam view in his later writings. In the guide, he calls this, well, continual creation or discrete acts of volition, he calls it um, a mockery. In fact, as is well known, Maimonides rejects the Kalam proofs of the existence, unity, and corporeality of God because they are based on the proofs for creation, which destroy the stable nature of all that exists. But Maimonides' rejection of the view that God wills the world into being at every instant does not mean that Maimonides rejects the picture that God can will something new that he did not will before, and there is evidence to believe that that is how he explains miracles in the guide. For example, in the guide, he cites the rabbinic explanation of certain biblical miracles being created at the time of creation. This is, this is what he had said earlier in the commentary of the mission. He cites it, he calls it wondrous or strange, aib, praising the rabbinic sages for finding it difficult that a nature may change after creation. The fact that miracles are somehow embedded within the natures of things, uh, at the time of creation, he gives two thumbs up to. But though the rabbinic sages come up with a quasi-naturalistic interpretation of miracles that finds favors in Maimonides, finds favor in Maimonides' sight, he ultimately understands miracles in the guide differently. Where the rabbinic sages hold that miracles too are, in a sense, natural, for example, as explained by Maimonides, they believe that the water's nature was such that when the Israelites walked through the Red Sea, it flowed upwards, and when the Egyptians walked through it, it flowed downwards. Maimonides claims that miracles involve temporary, temporary changes in the certain particulars that God willed to change. The most likely interpretation of this is that God's eternal wisdom required his will to effect a change in the nature of water when it changed, not to create something within the nature of water at the time of creation. A less likely, though possible, interpretation from Maimonides is that God eternally willed the Red Sea to split when it did. Aquinas, for example, distinguishes between God's eternally willing a change, like the creation of the world after its non-existence, and a change in God's will. And as we've seen before, Maimonides says that God's will, strictly speaking, does not change. But Maimonides does not take the Aquinas option, and the reason is, I think, because he understands God's eternal will to refer to something else. It refers to the governance of the world according to the natures of things. Thus, the phrase eternal will appears in the guide in conjunction with God's bringing calamities or punishments upon a people in accordance with his eternal will, which the medieval commentators understood as a natural consequences of their, a consequence of their wicked behavior. Moreover, when Maimonides discusses the creation of the world after its non-existent, he doesn't speak of God's eternal will, but rather of his immutable wisdom, which requires the world to come into existence at a certain instant, the first instant after its non-existence. 
This suggests the singularity, such as the creation of the world, has its roots in divine wisdom rather than in divine will. And this makes sense because will carries out what wisdom directs it to do. If the creation of the world were an act directed by divine will only, in the sense that wisdom was not involved, it would be intentionally pointless and futile, as we have seen. Similarly with miracles. Nobody would claim that miracles are arbitrary, pointless events. On the contrary, they reflect wisdom as well as will and power. Now, this is particularly true in the case of the, of, of the scriptural promises and threats. For example, if the Israelites, it is said, um, if you will walk in my ways, in the ways of the Lord God, I will give you rain in its, at its proper time. Now, in Maimonides' earlier writings, there is no indication that he understands the scriptural promises to involve anything contrary to nature or supernatural. They are given naturalistic interpretations. Basically, he writes, if the Israelites observe the commandments, then God will remove those things that prevent this observance, illness, poverty, etc. Maimonides mentions nothing about rain falling here as a consequence of observing commandments. His example suggests that he is, giving, he is understanding divine reward naturalistically. Observe the dietary laws of the Torah, and you will be healthy, thus able to study wisdom and philosophy, etc. But in the guide, Maimonides explicitly says that if the world is eternal, if the world is not a product of divine will, the way he understands it, in the non avicennan way, we could say, this gives the lie to miracles and to scripture's threats and promises. While he doesn't call the latter miraculous in the guide, he does call the threats and promises miraculous in the treatise on resurrection, which was written quite shortly after he completed the guide. There he writes, the law affirms it as a continuous miracle over that generation, that is, success in the Jews' activities if they obey God and failure if they disobey. The meaning of Deuteronomy 4, 19 to 20 is that the community situation does not follow the pattern of the situation of the other communities. No, they are singled out by this great miracle. Success or failure in their activities will always be linked to their actions. By calling the promises and threats miraculous, and by limiting them to the Jewish people, Maimonides, or at least the Israelites, Maimonides clearly indicates that the fulfillment of the promises and the threats is not to be given a naturalistic interpretation. In other words, obey my law and you will live healthy, productive lives. This is stated explicitly in Maimonides' last work, his medical aphorisms, where he criticizes Galen for misunderstanding the prophets Moses' teaching about divine will and power. In that work, Maimonides attributes to those who held that the world is eternal the view that God has no novel will or choice, and that's where it is said for the first time. It is evident for he who says that the world is eternal in this manner, the manner of the Aristotelians, that God has no novel will nor choice, and there is no possible thing existing on which he can exert his power and will, so that, for example, he is not able to give us one rain on one day, and to withhold it on another day according to his will. As the rainfall in this established nature follows the readiness of the vapors in the air which causes rain or prevents it, all this follows the readiness of matter, upon which God does not act, and the matter with which God cannot interfere. Here Maimonides says outright that the Torah's view is that God, according to his will, can give rain one day and withhold it on another day, Right. And that the belief in the eternity of the world implies the denial of this, God, this ability, the, the denial of this power, and the denial of God's novel will. Now, some readers of Maimonides at this point in my talk 
may respond that it is simply incredible to think that Maimonides genuinely believed that it was a continuous miracle for the generations that if the Jews observed the commandments, that they would be rewarded with rain. It is better to understand Maimonides' statements, they say, on this matter, as a reflection of what he calls a necessary belief for the sake of the people's welfare. Now, a necessary belief is a belief necessary for the abolition of reciprocal wrongdoing or for the acquisition of a noble moral quality. And the, one of the examples that Maimonides gives is God, there's a belief that God immediately um, answers prayers, responds to prayers immediately, and also gets angrily, gets angry when people do not uh, obey him. Now, um, the notion that this is a necessary belief, uh, in this case, would be the same as the, the myth taught to the, the Sabians, who are the, the, the stand-ins for the idolaters that Maimonides refers to. And that myth was that by obeying the instructions of the deity, the, the people would receive supernatural reward. The only difference being that the actual commandments were genuinely for their benefit and well-being. In other words, um, um, the claim is that the promises and the threats were a divine accommodation, which is Maimonides refers to several times in his explanation of the commandments, divine accommodation of the fact that the Israelites were used to the belief that they had from the Sabians that if you worship God in a certain way and obey his command or worship the gods, the idol, the idols, idolatry in a certain way, then you will get, uh, then you will be able to get uh, certain rewards. So this would be a necessary belief, but not that actually God miraculously brings rain on the Israelites uh, after performing commandments. Now, this is a common response among readers of Maimonides, but in my opinion, it rests on a misreading of the passage in Guide 332. In fact, what Maimonides wishes is to wean the Israelites away from is the Sabian belief that by performing certain ceremonies and practices, they cause the rain to fall. This belief in theurgy is, of course, a direct violation of Maimonides' view that what occurs below has no causal effect on what occurs above. All right, this is a sort of a straight philosophical view. But this is different from, if you will, it's a straight Professor Pesson's Neoplatonist view that the activity goes from the higher to the lower in the hierarchy of being. But this is different. This Sabian view that by performing commandments, one causes the rain to fall. This is different from God's promising to reward miraculously the Israelite observance of the law with rainfall, since both the promise and the actual reward serve as incentives for the Israelites to obey the law. And make no mistake about it, Maimonides claims that these threats and promises were in fact fulfilled. So once again, divine will follows upon divine wisdom. In this case, a wisdom motivating people to obey the law through a system of incentives and disincentives. And I just mentioned by, as an aside, this is very reminiscent um, of, 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 of a passage that Maimonides has um, in the uh, commentary on um, the 10th chapter of Sanhedrin where he talks about the various notions of the world to come, and whether it's a, it's a paradise, whether there are fountains and flowings and, 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 and all sorts of food, etc. And he says, basically, these scriptural and midrashic descriptions should have, were, able, were, were supposed to serve as motives for, for performing commandments, motivations me, for performing commandments. And just as we give children, he says, uh, uh, certain rewards, um, promise to buy them a pair of new shoes or something if they study the Torah, study Talmud. So to the Jews, the Israelites were, were, were given these incentives. And the incentives actually were given. You gave the, you give the shoes to the child and 
God performed the miracles in order for them, for the Israelites who were on a lower spiritual level, to be motivated to perform the commandments. Anyway, in the time remaining, I wish to examine what philosophical resources Maimonides has for this notion of divine, uh, or uh, sorry, this notion of novel will. As I said before, Maimonides claims that the notion that God is powerless to shorten the wing of a fly is a disgraceful notion concerning the deity. But he concedes that the Aristotelians don't agree with him on this. He also has an elaborate argument for creation that exposes deficiencies in Aristotle's celestial science and that he claims are the product of God's will or his inscrutable wisdom. Now, if his argument is a good one, there's the argument for creation is a good one, then and if he, it is correct to make the uh, connection between uh, creation out of, after absolute nothingness and the ability to uh, perform miracles or to have a have will one thing and not something that not that thing at a later time, then clearly um, 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 he has certain philosophical arguments for his view. But but these are for the most part negative arguments. That's what I wish to say. My question here is, does Maimonides have the resources that allow him to give a philosophical account of God's novel will? And my answer is, he does not, primarily because his philosophical worldview is still largely Aristotelian. While he recognizes that his views on these matters are not Aristotelian, in fact, are opposed by the Aristotelians, he does not, and I would suggest he cannot, provide an alternative explanation. Although, as we shall see, he hints that an explanation could be forthcoming. And at times, he seems to lapse into the Aristotelian way of looking at these matters. So does Maimonides have a model of modality that allow for unactualized... Unactual, oh, sorry again. Let's see if I can get that back here that allows for unactualized possibilities. Well, the idea that God chooses to create the world in a certain way at a certain time, but he could have chosen otherwise, he could have chosen otherwise, or that he could choose to change or destroy it, suggests a model of modality that allows for alternative, unactualized possibilities. Now, that model is adopted by the Kalam theologians, who claim that anything that can be imagined is possible. And so for anything to exist, there is required a particularizer to choose among the possibilities. This particularizer is only minimally constrained. He can't create and not create something simultaneously. But there is nothing in the nature of things that determine his choice. The particularizer chooses to actualize a set of possibilities among other real possibilities or to accord existence rather than non-existence to the world, both states being considered equally possible. Now, on the one hand, Maimonides seems to reject this view. He argues that the intellect and not the imagination is the arbiter or criterion of what is possible. Yet, on the other hand, he himself holds that the world was created after absolute non-existence, and he realizes that this is considered by the Aristotelians to be unintelligible. In one passage... Actually, in more than one passage, he wonders out loud what criterion enables us to distinguish the possible from the impossible. And in one of those passages, he poses six questions, one after the other, none of which he attempts to answer. One of those questions is how imagination is to be distinguished from the intellect. You can say that only the intellect should determine what is possible or not. But how, he asks, are we to, to differentiate imagination from intellect. And at the end of this passage, he writes, all these points, all these are points for investigation, which may lead very far. Now that rules out a principled skepticism, in my view, on his part, but it leaves the reader hanging as to whether Maimonides has a theory that can account for God's choosing or particularizing the world to come into existence in a philosophically respectable way. What we would like Maimonides to explain is in what way is the non-existence of the world possible? How is he understanding possible here? 
clearly does not wish to say that what is imaginable for God is possible since God does not have an imagination. In other words, what is missing is a philosophical explanation for the moderately robust voluntarism to which he's committed. He needs a theory of possibility that will allow him to go beyond the Aristotelianism that rejects miracles and creation ex nihilo as impossible, that indeed accepts a principle of plenitude, which says, as we will see in a minute, Maimonides actually formulates every real possibility is actualized, at least at some time. He needs a theory of possibility without falling into the trap of Kalam voluntarism, especially the Asherite view, as he brings it, that the divine will determines at every instant the configuration of the world, a view that denies the natures of things according to Maimonides. That Maimonides wishes to stake out a middle position between the Kalam and the Aristotelians on the issue is seen frequently throughout the guide. It is seen in his appropriation of Kalam, the Kalam view of God as particularizer, provided that the nature of what exists is not destroyed. It is seen in his approval of God's bringing in the world into existence after non-existence through will, although God's wisdom decreed it to be so. It is seen in his view that God wills the anomalous movements of the heavens by implanting into the celestial bodies natures according to what divine wisdom requires a nod to the philosophers, because he talks about natures, but which cannot be explained on Aristotelian principles. Now, Maimonides does cite Aristotle's oft-repeated notion that, quote, nature is wise and does not do anything without an object, and it does everything in the most perfect possible way, end quote. But he goes on to say, as we have seen, that divine wisdom, which is eternal, does not necessitate that the world is eternal, but determines that the world come into existence at a certain point. What is the status of states of affairs that have not yet come into existence because God has not yet willed them into existence? Now, there are two statements in Guide 325 that appear to rule out the notion of unactualized possibilities. At the end of the chapter, Maimonides holds that God primarily intends to bring into being, quote, Everything whose existence is possible, existence being indubitably a good. And earlier in the chapter, he says that God's entire purpose consists in bringing into existence everything that possibly exists in the manner that you see. In all these sentences, the emphasis is on the world being a place of maximum existence, maximum good as opposed to a world which is willed into being by a God who does not act from wisdom or for the good, as, as the ignorant think. That Maimonides draws on Aristotelian teleology and on the classical principle of plenitude is not surprising. He is, after all, talking about the natural world in the manner that we experience, not a situation in which the natures of things are dispend, suspended through divine will, consequent upon divine wisdom. Yet, there is a line in Guide 325, which, if interpreted in a certain manner, suggests that Maimonides allows for unactualized possibilities. As it's, it's at the bottom of this slide. As translated by Shlomo Pines, as well as Solomon Monk and Samuel Ibn Tibon, the line reads, quote, God wills only what is possible, and not everything that is possible, but only that which is required by his wisdom to be such. End quote. This can be read to suggest that there are possible natures or states of affairs that are not required by the divine wisdom to be brought into existence, but still can be willed into existence in certain circumstances should God's wisdom require it. Now, recently, Alfred Avery has rejected this, this third statement on the basis of the other two statements, actually on the basis of the statement, the first statement we cited, which is at the end of the chapter. But in Maimani's last work, his critique of Galen on Mosaic religion, that with, with which he concludes his medical aphorisms, Maimani's, for, Maimani's formulation is suggestive of a God that wills the best among possibilities that are not actualized. After rejecting Galen's views that according to Moses, God can do that which is impossible, Maimani's writes, but we do not accept this, but say, there are things which are impossible in themselves, 
and these God never wishes to come about. But he wishes only possible things to occur. And among the possible things, oh, sorry. Among the possible things, he only chooses the best and most adequate and excellent. This Leibnizian sounding formulation still lacks a philosophical account that explains the notion of unactualized possibility. But it certainly shows a Maimonides who deviates from the standard statistical model of modality found in Aristotle. Unfortunately, Maimonides says nothing about the status of possible things that are less than the best, that God doesn't choose. One of the medieval commentators in the guide, Shem Tov ben Joseph ibn Shem Tov, gives us an example, a hand with six fingers rather than five. That would be possible for God to create, but would not be the best. In any event, I see nothing in, th in Guide 325 which rules out or even goes against the statement made earlier in 219 that, quote, all things exist in virtue of a purpose and not of necessity, and that he who purposed them may change them and conceive another purpose, though not absolutely any purpose whatever. For the nature of impossibility is stable and cannot be abolished, as we shall make clear, end quote. God cannot do the impossible, but precisely what is impossible is at the heart of the dispute between the creationist and the eternalist. If we assume that Maimonides genuinely believed that God created the world after absolute nothingness and that this was incompatible with the view of the philosophers, then God is to be exempted from the classical principle of plenitude, which Maimonides formulates as, quote, it is indubitable that what is possible with regard to a species must necessarily come about. This will be affirmed by the Aristotelians, but not by Maimonides, in reference either to creation or to miracles. The world created by God, in accordance with his wisdom, operates according to the principle of plenitude, but God is not necessitated to create that world, and in fact, could create something else. So, to conclude, how far does Maimonides go in rejecting Avicenna's compatibilist approach to divine will and necessity? The answer is very far. But he does not go over to what he considers to be the, 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 the side of the Kalam and its analysis of possibility. Given the work in recent years on Ghazali and uh, the attempts to view him more with or, or less within a, a uh, um, aimless, pointless, voluntaristic Asherite perspective, it is indeed worthwhile to compare Maimonides with, with Ghazali. But I can tell you right now, in my opinion, unlike Ghazali, Maimonides is, does not break with the conceptual framework of the Aristotelians. And when he has problems with that framework, is very, very open about it. He is left, therefore, with unreconciled commitments and with this very tantalizing statement in 315, points for investigation that may lead very far. Uh,